uh, as you can see, it is obvious that we are all here gathered today because of our shared concerns and beliefs uh, when it comes to water, environment, peace building, conflict management, and so many other things that is bringing us together today. Uh, and you do believe, from, I, I think from your experience, you do believe that we live in a troubled region. And um, we may now call it actually a troubled, a troubled, troubled world, but you do believe that uh, from your previous experience in the Middle East that we live in a troubled region. So we would like to know more from you today about your perception um, when it comes to the consequences of these uh, conflicts uh, on the environment. Well, thank you, Noir. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Let me let me start by saying that um, you know I have great respect for the work that Echo Peace does. I consider you to be a real leader in the in the community practice, and so it's a particular honor to have the chance to to, to speak with you today and work with you today. Um, I'm usually uh, considered the old man in the room. I've been doing this work for a long time. I taught my first class on environmental peace building, not even really recognizing that concept. Uh, 30 years ago, when I was a graduate student at, at Berkeley, working on my on, on on my PhD, and the first work that I published on this was in the early 2000s, and and, and even then, Echo Peace was already out in the field, um, uh, doing the actual work. And and one thing I often say when I'm asked to give remarks is that. Uh, this is a field that was crowdsourced from the start. Most of what we know did not come from the classroom. It did not come from the scholarship of people such as myself. It came from a community of practice that was that was trying a, a, and experimenting and building programs such as the, the very impressive work that you just described on, on, on youth and young professional education. So it's really terrific to be here. Um, when it comes to the, 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 the challenges around conflict in the environment, uh, I think our attention is often drawn to the direct effects. Uh, we see the, the, the terrible destructive power of war and the terrible destructive power of conflict on the environment. Um, we're getting a tragic illustration of that uh, in, in Syria, for example, in, in, in recent years and in many other places around the world. And in fact, even just the preparation for war takes a very heavy toll on the environment. Um, some years back, someone calculated the climate footprint, the carbon footprint of the United Nations uh, peacekeeping, peacekeeping efforts. And they found that the carbon footprint of those activities was the equivalent of a major global city. So even just preparing for war uh, takes a heavy toll. But what I like to emphasize is the indirect consequences that can be just as disruptive. Um, conflict disrupts the positive practices that we need for a sustainable environment. Irrigation systems don't get managed, trees don't get planted, agricultural terraces don't get rebuilt on, on a seasonable uh, uh, basis. Um, people are forced into mobility and migration when they, when they might prefer not to, and spaces and places get fragmented and bordered in ways that people uh, cannot come together. Uh, and these indirect consequences, I think, are, are, are just as telling in the toll that they take on the environment. Uh, and finally, we should also note that one of the tragic consequences of conflict is that it forces people into uh, poor decision making based on sh uh, short term time horizons. Uh, there are some tragic stories, for example, documented in, in Afghanistan, uh, in the conflict in Armenia and Azerbaijan, uh, of people cutting down entire orchards, uh, fruit trees, nut trees, walnuts, uh, orchards that would provide a sustainable livelihood for people in an environmentally sound manner uh, for decades uh, being cut down because they couldn't rely on uh, being able to stay on the land for the following harvest season. And so they collected what value they could out of the timber uh, that was in the trees. We see this time and time again, people forced into overfishing, uh, people forced to convert forests into charcoal. These are not decisions that they would normally take with an eye toward a sustainable future, uh, but conflict often forces them into that. So it's important to note the direct effects, but it's also important to note the second order effects that disrupt institutions uh, and force people into profoundly unsustainable uh, forms of behavior. So I would look at it in another way. So as I understood from what you're saying is that it is definite that the environment can play actually a key role uh, in shaping the foundations for peace and reconciliation. So knowing that and from your uh, experience, um, 
Are there some potential approaches for addressing the environment as a peace building tool rather than uh, looking at it as uh, as um, as a yeah, I mean, rather than looking at the disadvantages of the conflicts of um, um, the conflict, the, the conflicts uh, disadvantages of the environment, can we look at potential approaches to to uh, uh, address the environment as a as a key for peace building? Sure, uh, without question, and uh, I think we've actually learned quite a bit through research on environmental peace building over the last few decades. And we're, we're getting to the point now where we actually are able to make some statements about what works. Um, often, I think when we think about the environment as a peace building tool, uh, we're first drawn to the idea that we share the space, we share an ecosystem, and therefore um, there are mutual benefits to be had from cooperation and collaboration. Uh, and Guidon, when he was talking about the mayors and the big jump, uh, in his in his opening remarks, uh, really signaled that I think that is the, the the starting point and the foundation. And I certainly agree with that that we have to start with this idea of mutual gains. But I think there's much more to to it than that. And I I, I would flag three key concepts: first, dialogue; second, trust; and third, uh, identities. And and on each of those, I think. Now that we have a few decades of a community of practice that's actually out there trying to implement some of these ideas, I think we're just getting to the point where we're able to start to, to observe that, to conduct research on it in a rigorous way, and, and to say what works. So for example, on the idea of dialogue, um, bringing people together uh, to have conversations around those mutual gains, around their shared interests, um, it, it is a critically important piece of that. And I think historically we've looked at that because we believe that it will transform people's consciousness, that it will transform their understanding of themselves and of people on the other side of a conflict divide uh, and make it possible to collaborate in the future. And I think that's certainly true. But one of the things that we've learned is the critical value of those dialogues is when they actually strengthen the capabilities of people to actually be peacemakers. So it's not enough to engage in dialogue. You need to engage in dialogue in a way that trains people, that helps them understand the issues, and helps them be positioned uh, to take advantages, uh, to, to, to take advantage of opportunities uh, to realize those mutual gains. Uh, the same is true with shared identities. Um, one of the foundational premises, I think, in the field of environmental peace building is that um, shared identities can be a powerful tool for dialogue. Um, that it is possible to bring farmers together with farmers in a way that can bridge the conflict divide. That it is possible to bring scientists together with other scientists, to bring young people together with other young people. And the idea here is that their identity as a farmer, as a scientist, as a young person, allows them to relate, allows them to connect, allows them to have a conversation uh, despite all of the challenges uh, of, of conflict settings. And again, I think what we've learned through a few decades of experiments with trying to do this work is that's absolutely the case. Um, I mean, I have, I have stood together with Israeli and Palestinian date farmers having a conversation about growing dates. And you can see that their identity as a farmer, the land ethic that they bring, the understanding of the craft uh, you know, of, of, of making the trees flourish, um, gives them a, a very powerful basis for dialogue. But again, it's not enough. The key is how they take what they learn back home and how they transform as individuals, then connect that back into wider social networks and that they be able to sustain those dialogues uh, over, over time. And a third key approach that I think is important involves the question of equity. Um, there's no question that there are mutual gains to be had uh, all, all, all over the place. If we can look at the Jordan River Valley as an ecosystem, not in the fragmented, bounded, and bordered way that it is so common to look at it today, but as one system, there are countless opportunities for collaborative gain that are there. But one thing that we've learned is that the question of equity always has to be put front and center 
when we have those conversations. There is always a distributive component and a distributive conversation that has to be had. And it's always important to confirm that those mutual gains are, are pursued in a way that is perceived by all parties as equitable. Those can be difficult conversations, but they're conversations that it's absolutely essential that we engage in. So I would say dialogue, shared identities, and equity um, in my mind, are, are three of the key building blocks going forward. I actually second the the uh, the three building blocks, but I would like to to uh, second that a common identity actually allows for communication and negotiation, and sometimes it actually uh, uh, allows for a common vision and forms uh, the basis for um, a, a perfect dialogue. Let's say. And uh, Ken, it is obvious that your research focuses on water governance, environment, conflict, and peace building. And looking at your previous work, um, you have advised your students to research projects on water and peace building in the Middle East. So can you tell us more on the impact of peace building education on conflict resolution? Sure, without question. And, and it's a great question. And thank you for that. Um, and again, this would be a place where I would reiterate that I think much of what we know comes from the experience of practitioners. And so, um, I mean, I've been teaching courses in, in, in peace building education with an environmental focus for 30 years. And I've certainly learned an enormous amount from my students uh, and learned a lot about what works uh, in, in, in the classroom. But I've learned just as much by observing, I mean, education is where you find it. Education is any place in a person's life uh, where they're engaged uh, and, and where they're learning. And most of the most important education in our lives, of course, occurs uh, outside uh, the classroom. I think one casualty of conflict, and I alluded to this earlier, is the way that it fragments what people are able to know and people are able to understand about water. Again, it's just so hard to see the Jordan River Valley as a watershed, as this tightly interconnected system uh, that we have to manage jointly uh, if we're going to manage it sustainably, that we have to jo manage jointly if we're going to manage it uh, equitably, that we have to manage jointly if we're going to manage in a resilient manner, given the challenges of, of, of climate change. There are countless opportunities for improvement, for smarter water view, reuse, for reducing people's vulnerability to disruptions such as those that, that, that climate change is introducing, if we can see the entire system. And so one role of peace building building education is just to get people to be able to see that wider uh, vision. But I think a second key role of peace building education is to get people to, to see that system in a different way, in a more creative way, uh, in, in a problem solving way. Um, often when uh, people ask me questions about water, and again, I, as you noted, I do a lot of work on water, I often speak about water, people are drawn to thinking about water in terms of the supply of fresh water. And they often view that as a zero sum game, as a fixed pie. More water for me means less water for you. And that immediately leads to a sort of a, uh, a wary and a securitized dialogue around water where it can be very, very difficult to find equitable solutions. One of the things that I think peace building education can do for us is to encourage us to look beyond just the question of freshwater allocation. Critically important though that obviously is, um, wastewater treatment, the linkages between water and public health, the possibilities for climate change adaptation. These are situations where we're dealing with a public good, where we truly are dealing with mutual gains from all parties if they can come together and coordinate their activities, learn from each other uh, and collaborate. And so I think a key power from peace building education is that it let us, lets us not just see these systems, but see them in new ways and look at them not simply as a resource pie to be divided up, um, but also as a system that brings us together for uh, common problem solving opportunities. Perfect, that was uh, really inspiring. So from what you're saying, we must always push for uh, the win-win scenarios and look at the environment as a peace building tool. So we need to join efforts to protect the available resources. So uh, we would like you to highlight about uh, the, the possible ways that can actually widen the conversation about promoting the environment as a peace building tool. 
Sure. And so, um, Particularly at this moment in time, I think widening the conversation uh, is critically important. Um, and here, and one of the reasons I'm really excited to be with you all this morning is that I think that into you know, the work that EcoPeace is doing around educating youth and around uh, working with young professionals um, is, is absolutely critical. You know, I spend a lot of time in the classroom uh, with, 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 with young people and I, it keeps me young and it keeps me inspired. And I think it, it, it's critically important to tap uh, the energy of, of young people, uh, the impatience of young people, uh, the idealism uh, of young people. But, but I come at it from a slightly different perspective than I think uh, the, the common perspective. I think sometimes people look at youth as being not yet fully formed, not, not, not yet settled and hardened in their opinions, and almost as though they were a form of malleable clay that could be molded into the kind of identity that we want uh, for, for, for a better future. Um, I suppose there may be some truth to that, but when I, when I work with youth, I, I, I find that youth culture is a very, very powerful tool. Uh, there's something about the way that young people connect with the wider world. There's something about the way that young people connect with art and film and music uh, and literature. There's something about the way that young people just sort of, you know, intuitively uh, connect uh, with technology in a way that we older folks have to be sort of sometimes led, led along um, that creates a very, very powerful uh, opportunity uh, for engagement, uh, for building a network, for not just changing people's sensibility, but for then sort of sending them back into the wider social networks that they're connected with, carrying forth that message. And so many people who work in environmental peace building will say, scientists are one such powerful network that we can bring together across a conflict divide because they'll take that message back with authority. Uh, farmers, people actually work with natural resources are, a, are another powerful such network. Well, I agree with that, but I think youth is really a powerfully untapped uh, network in that regard. And that's why I find the work that EcoPeace is doing to be so uh, very exciting. A second key element to that, I think, is the young professionals work. Um, and the, here I would simply highlight that the actual work of peace building, it doesn't occur in the classroom. It doesn't even occur in diplomatic council chambers, although those are obviously important settings. It occurs in the arts. It occurs in filmmaking. It occurs in engineering, the building of infrastructure. It occurs in commerce. It occurs in sustainable agriculture. It occurs in city and regional planning. And so by bringing young people together, building those capabilities that they're talking about, but then plugging them back into those networks of practice where the actual work of peace building will either occur or not occur on a daily basis. To me, that is an absolutely critical network to be building out uh, and sustaining uh, going forward. And the final point that I would make here and, and I, just very briefly, is that um, there also needs to be uh, re-education and training uh, of older folks who are in more senior positions of leadership. And so one of the things that I've done some work on that I find quite exciting is on the development of educational programs, uh, tool crits, toolkits, excuse me, uh, online uh, training courses and so on for more senior people who are out there working in, in communities of practice uh, to learn more about environmental peace building themes and how they can connect that uh, to their own work. Uh, these are actually very promising remarks, uh, but here comes the question of commitment. So for example, how can we uh, sustain long-term commitment and willingness to take uh, to, to make a change or to, to, to take an action uh, during the different challenges or uh, in, or in other words, or to be more precise, uh, how can uh, how can the participants or your students uh, stay relevant and engaged even after uh, the intense program ends, for example? Well, again, a terrific question. And, and in many ways, this is the challenge, right? Because I think um, peace is a marathon. It's not a sprint. 
Um, and people who think that we can sprint to peace often simply wind up exhausting themselves and then departing uh, from the racetrack rather than sustaining uh, the, the, the run in some sense that, that, that is needed. Uh, and, and, and not all moments are equally ripe for peace. And so one of the things that I think we are doing in this work is simply pre-positioning a network of people uh, with powerful ideas, uh, with knowledge about the issues, with practical initiatives that they believe could in fact uh, be implemented uh, if the space were just created for them, if the opportunities for them were just, just were created. And that means that we absolutely constantly have to be thinking about sustaining our networks, building out our networks, reproducing our networks, and keeping connected with each other. Um, I get a lot of emails from people all around the world uh, that are that are doing this work, uh, you know, and back in the day when it was just a very small group of idealistic people who had some crazy notions about what might have been possible. Um, I would always take a lot of time to try to answer those communications, engage with people. And I, I would always say, stay connected to me. Uh, because it's important to know that you're not alone in doing this work. It's important to know that you're not crazy in trying to do this work. It's important to know that there are hundreds and thousands of other people all around the world that, that, are, that are trying to do this work. One of the exciting things that's happened in recent years is I think that community of practice is becoming increasingly well connected. Um, we're starting to see a lot of different platforms, some in the scholarly world, some in the world of practice, some among donors that are allowing people to make those sorts of connections. One that I would highlight for people on this call is a new entity called the Environmental Peace Building Association. Uh, we just had about, let's see, about one year ago today, in, it, well, in October of last year, we had the annual meeting, of the, uh, the first annual meeting of the Environmental Peace Building Association. And it was a gathering of some 300 people from all over the world, people working in education, people working in research, people working in foundations, people working in the community of practice uh, to share experiences and to, and to talk about what works uh, in, in, in this field. One of the really exciting things that the Environmental Peace Building Association has done has created a series of interest groups. And these are just coalitions of the willing, people that come together from those different sectors uh, to exchange ideas, to exchange knowledge, to do some professional networking, and to stay connected. And so there is a water interest group. Uh, there's a very dynamic and active young professionals interest group that I would encourage people on this call uh, to certainly uh, take a look at. Uh, I'm part of a group on environmental peace building education that brings together people that are doing work on education inside the classroom and outside the classroom uh, to dialogue. Uh, and the last thing that I would say about sustaining this long-term commitment is the importance of mentoring. And here, I think I particularly would like to have a message to some of the younger people that are involved in this work. Uh, mentoring is critically important, uh, and we all look uh, for mentoring. And one of the challenges that I faced coming up in this field was that it was such a new enterprise. It was difficult to find more senior people, more experienced people in the world that, 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 that could provide that mentoring that I needed. But, you know, you find it where you can find it, and, and, and you, you, you make a path forward the best you can. Um, it's important to seek out mentoring, but it's also important to realize that you yourself uh, are, are a mentor. Um, so if you've been through one of these programs, you know things that you can pass forward to the people that are coming along behind you. And one of the things that I think we often make a mistake in is that we're so busy looking for the mentoring that we need to move forward ourselves. We don't realize there's a line of people forming just behind us and that occasionally by looking over our shoulder, even at a, at a relatively early stage in your involvement in this, you too can uh, critically uh, provide that, that mentoring value uh, that we all need uh, and, and, and that we all look for. And so I would encourage you to stop and think about, you know, what have I learned? How can I pass on what I've learned? How can I not just push it forward in my own life, but how can I look back over my shoulder and share the wisdom of, of what I learned and be that mentor uh, that I'm also seeking? 
Thank you. This is uh, this is just wonderful and it's uh, crucial, especially that uh, we're we're approaching the end of the year and most of our programs actually just ended this year and we will start uh, with a new cohort in the uh, next year. And I would like uh, to highlight that uh, one, one member from the Young Professionals Group and one member from the Water Interest Group that uh, Ken has just uh, highlighted will be with us uh, during later sessions today. And uh, as we informed our audience, um, Ken, the Q&A is open for our panel and in order to engage also with the audience who are sitting behind the screens, uh, we would like to take some questions from the audience that have been sent to uh, us. So the first is, um, is asking uh, if you have been able to evaluate the impact of environmental education initiatives. Yeah, um, it's it, it's a challenge, right? Because um, when you're when you're doing environmental education in the classroom, uh, whether it's peace building oriented or or, or 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 just more general environmental education, um, there's always a challenge. You know, we we assess the students at the at the end of the semester, uh, and we ask them if they were satisfied with the class and if they have any suggestions for improvement, and that's and that's very very valuable uh, knowledge. Um, but when I think back to my own educational experience, I had no idea at the time uh, what were going to be the most important uh, experiences that I had. And I certainly wasn't in a position uh, to evaluate. It, it was what stayed with me and it was, it, it, it was what lasted with me. Um, and when you do more of the sort of the short course and the training kinds of things, whether we're bringing together sort of a group of foreign aid officers or diplomats and working with them in an intensive weekend workshop type of setting or, 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 or doing the, the, the sort of work. Um, it, 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 it's hard, in fact, to, 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 to assess what works. And so one of the things that I think is really exciting uh, about the work that Ecopeace is doing is that, is that over the long term, um, it's really sometimes just circling back to people two years later, three years later, five years later uh, and asking them. So one of the things that I've actually started doing in my own work, just to learn for myself, but also to share those experiences with my own students is to reach out to my former students, uh, particularly students who've come and, and done the interdisciplinary master's degree that we run uh, in, 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 in global environmental policy, which has a strong peace building element to it. Um, at American University, where I teach in, in, in Washington, DC. Um, and record interviews with them, you know, five, 10 years out, they're now out in the field and they're working. And I find it's really sometimes only at that point in time that they can reflect back on. And I will ask them questions like, what do you wish you'd known when you were starting the program? Uh, what did you learn from this program? What were the takeaway messages? And I found that to me, that longer term perspective uh, is really the key uh, to improvement and to innovation. Yes, and another uh, another key, another important key is, as you just mentioned, is taking feedback from those who were actually participants of uh, previous environmental education initiatives or projects, and try to involve them in building contents and designing the program for the upcoming years. So this is what we what we are basically doing at Ecopeace, as uh, the year 2018 was a pilot year for many uh, com educational components. Uh, actually, another is asking. Another question is asking about the. Um, uh, okay, so the openness for dialogue. So it says uh, if you have found that the new generations are more open to dialogue, and uh, versus uh, when you started, and if you have also found them more aware of the environmental challenges that the region faces. Sure. And, and so I think, um, so I'll take both of those questions in turn. Um, I think the question of uh, o o openness to dialogue um, is, is, I think it's something that proceeds in, in, in stages. I think anyone who's concerned about the environment, uh, anyone who has any form of experience uh, with environmental issues, I think fairly quickly realizes that uh, these are collective problems. These are problems that join us, you know, upstream, downstream, left bank of the river, uh, right bank of the river, you know, edge of the forest, other edge of the forest. You know, the, the social distinctions that we bring are uh, artificial, right? And, and, and nature just doesn't acknowledge those social distinctions. It sometimes suffers 
because of those social borders and distinctions that we create, but it certainly doesn't doesn't acknowledge them. And so I think this is one of the reasons why the environment is can be such a powerful peace building tool, because I think that we are we are open to that sort of experience. That to me is, is, is the first stage, that stage of awareness. But I think what has to come to truly be open to dialogue, the second stage has got to be um, it, it, it experiential, you know? And so I talked about, I talked about farmers, uh, let, let's like date farmers, right? Farmers who, 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 who grow trees, you know, and on one side of a conflict divide, they might be growing trees in a certain manner and another side, they might be growing trees in another manner. Well, they understand that this is a regionally affected enterprise. They understand that there are pests in the region that will, you know, go right across the border and affect their trees. And so, and they understand that these are problems that demand a joint form of management. But until they've had the chance to, 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 to walk on each other's land, to see each other in the way that they actually, actually practice, to understand what it's like to grow dates when you are water constrained, or when you have to constantly be thinking about the salinity of the water or countless other sorts of considerations, that I think then sort of becomes the second, the second stage of dialogue. And so the important thing about peace building education and environmental education, and why I think there are so many synergies is they're both almost inherently experiential uh, at, at some point. And I think it's tapping that experiential component that is really, really critical, not just to getting people opened for dialogue, but, but to really you know, helping them come to that dialogue you know, with a deeper piece of understanding. So I would certainly stress the experiential component of that um, very much. Thank you, thank you, that was wonderful. And uh, coming to our last question that I'm going to take today. Uh, by the way, we have so many questions, so I encourage the media team if they can collect the, uh, the questions and then we can later on send answers or maybe we can have it published on our website. So Absolutely. an important question actually is, um, is uh, saying that today there has been there uh, there has been discussion about the importance of gender equality and women's role in the uh, national resource management and environmental uh, peace building why does literature on development focus on this so much and uh, more than the academic literature sure well i think that's changing I, I would say there is a lot of good scholarship in recent years uh, that, 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 that's been created. And you had mentioned, just I'll just throw one thing out there for people who might be interested. You had mentioned in that, the very generous introduction of me that you gave earlier that I had recently published uh, the Oxford Handbook of Water Politics and Policy. And one of the things we were trying to do with that book was very much take a forward looking approach. It was not meant to be an encyclopedia of what we know. It was not so much what we know as where we need to go. And there's some very good work, I think, in that volume on, on, on some of the water uh, dynamics, gender water dynamics that I would encourage people uh, to take a look at by some, by some real thought leaders. Um, uh, social structure conditions everything. Uh, you know, the, 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 the categories that we are socialized into, the different life experiences that we have from the start, uh, you know, it, it, can, it creates vulnerabilities, it creates opportunities, uh, it creates sensibilities that we simply need uh, to understand. Uh, one of the things that I've done a fair bit of work on is water recycling. Um, gray water recycling in particular. How can you take water at, and at the, at very localized at the household level um, and actually take water that's going into a waste stream um, and, 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 and translate it in, 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 into a usable resource? Um, and one of the things that I have learned uh, from those programs, um, it, if the women are not part of that conversation, there's simply no possibility uh, for making uh, significant progress. We know that women's vulnerabilities are often different than men's, right? This is a critically important insight, right? We know that much of the provisioning of water at the household level, much of the backbreaking labor of hauling water or staying home from school and waiting for the water truck to come or whatever it may be, we know that that impact falls disproportionately on women. And it's critically important to rectify those inequities. But at the same time, we also know that given the central role that women play in those forms of, of water provisioning, they're absolutely critical gatekeepers. So, 
you could stand in, in the front of, of, of someone's home and, and, and talk to a, a male member of the household about water recycling and have a very creative and positive dialogue about creating a livelihood resource and collaborating in the neighborhood and, and, and understanding the ecosystem better. And that's very, very productive. But if you don't go around to the back of the house and engage all members of the household in that conversation, how is the water budget of the household managed? Is this system working, right? What about the smell? What about the products that are being used in the household that can or can't be put into the gray water stream? Um, then you're not dealing with the actual management of water and the different ways that that management affects people. And those differences operate at all human scale. They operate at the scale of individuals. They operate at the scale of communities. They operate at the scale um, of neighborhoods. They operate at the scale of entire nations. And so I think bringing those recognitions, both about different vulnerabilities, but also, also about entry points and voice and, and, and opportunities for change um, is actually critically important. So I appreciate the question very much. Yes, it is definitely uh, critical and uh, from here I would like to conclude with uh, the statement that the consequences of conflicts actually on the environment are real and our mindsets uh, need to change so we need to push for a different way uh, of looking at uh, the current challenges and the challenges that we might encounter in the future years and to try to look at these conflicts and challenges as uh, opportunities to build trust trust and uh, unify identities. Thank you very, very much, Ken. Uh, that was a valuable and inspiring input. It was definitely eye-opening.